rushes. A rushed rush through the weekly rushes. A rushed rush through your weekly streaming and movie news. And if you can hear strange belching sounds in the background, it's my incredibly hungry lower abdomen. And so, as ever, we're starting with some of the more contentious news that's been out there, and it surrounds Kevin Spacey. As you'll um, have probably seen, Kevin Spacey has had four charges of sexual assault brought against him, with a fifth offence uh, of causing a man to engage in penetrative sexual activity without consent. Uh, these pivot around his time in the UK as creative director or creative chief of the old Vic Theatre in London. Um, so, yeah, this story broke this week. Obviously, Kevin Spacey has kind of wriggled and moved around other allegations. He hasn't as yet been found guilty of anything. And we, we posed the question, I think, last week or the week before, you know, until proven guilty of something, does he not have the right to kind of carry on working, carry on plying his trade, etc.? And I said, clearly, there are a number of filmmakers out there who feel that he can and should have that right. Well, interestingly, uh, the uh, producers of Peter 5-8, which is one of the films that he's currently uh, selling or that they're trying to sell at the Cannes Film Festival. I mean, this, this news landing must have been pretty pretty tough perhaps for them to sell the film unless they're going to try and sell it off the back of the notoriety of, of, of Kevin Spacey. Uh, this is a quote from the producers of the film Peter 5-8 which was kind of marking Kevin Spacey's return to the big screen uh, you know after a sort of you know six year five six year absence. They say while it's unfortunate that increased negative press is timed with Kevin returning to work it's also to be expected. There are those who wish for him not to act but they are outnumbered by fans worldwide who await an artist they've enjoyed for decades returning to the screen. The production has no knowledge or comment on the various swirling allegations and believe it's a matter for the courts to determine validity if it exists. Peter 5-8 is a film for fans who care more for the art than the scandal. And so it's a really tricky one again, isn't it? It's like, oh, you know, if he's done these things, then absolutely no. But in the, you know, if, if you're working on the premise of innocent until proven guilty, I suppose you have to you have to allow for the possibility that he can make these films, uh, they can be made and what have you. Obviously, he was dropped from House of Cards, uh, the Netflix series, once the, all the scandals kind of landed. He was replaced by Christopher Plummer in the movie All the Money in the World, in which they actually reshot every single scene he featured in. And I think, if I'm, I'm right in remembering, Christopher Plummer actually got nominated for an Oscar, actually, for uh, replacing him and playing the part. As it stands, it's unclear as to whether um, extradition uh, proceedings will be will be enacted and whether uh, Spacey is going to be brought over to the UK, though it does stand that if he lands or travels through the UK, um, there is the opportunity, there will be the opportunity to charge him formally and, and to essentially arrest him. But what do you think, guys? What do you think? Do you, again, going back to this debate, should he be allowed, whatever you think of him, until he's been proven guilty, should he have the right to be able to make these films and should the producer have the right to sell them in the interim. Tragic news this week, of course, we all know that Ray Liotta died tragically at the uh, very tender age of 67, which is nothing, it's absolutely nothing. Um, we posted on our Popcorn Junkies Instagram account um, a little detail I didn't realise until we, I was looking up and you know about his childhood and his birth and all that, that he was uh, adopted at the age of just a few months old. I mean, right from the beginning of his, his life, he was kind of, wow, I mean, talk rags to riches, rags to riches or what. I'd forgotten, but I'd only just really kind of been reminded by the director Edgar Wright who obviously uh, spaced and all the kind of Simon Pegg movies and Last Night in Brooklyn, no, Last Night in Soho. Um, he posted on his Twitter uh, a scene, the end of a scene in uh, Something Wild, that film starring Melanie Griffiths. Uh, brilliant film, brilliant film, in which he played Melanie Griffiths kind of uh, ex-con nut job husband. Brilliant, very good looking, very sinister. He had that sort of, you, you could tell he was always going to sort of head towards the kind of gangster type thing. He then obviously went on to act opposite Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams. But of course, his most memorable role has to be, has to be uh, his role in Goodfellas, in which he played Henry Hill in Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. Uh, and, you know, a sort of gangster, paranoid gangster epic in which he played the kind of good guy. He was charming. He was vulnerable. He had emotional complexity to him whilst around him all the kind of baddies Joe Pesci Rob De Niro all that lot complete nutters he was the sort of slightly naive he had more sort of morals if you like he he was he, he kind of tugged against the kind of you know the senseless violence of the gangster underworld and so he brought I thought real nuance to that role and, and paranoia I mean I mean that film had a huge impact so for me Ray Liotta was almost the manifestation of, of Martin Scorsese's cinema in much the way that Robert De Niro was of, of Scorsese's earlier films uh, he was obviously in other movies like The Many Saints of Newark he was in recently he played again a really sinister older 
uh, gangster, but with, with real comic undertones. He was very funny. And I, one of my favorite, in fact, it was my favorite part of Marriage Story uh, was his role uh, opposite Laura Dern as the divorce attorney. He was just so brilliantly extreme and bonkers and wild and weird and, and kind of dirty and odd and Oh, and, and you kind of couldn't help but feel with him with that remarkably craggy face, how much of his roles were actually the Ray Liotta of real life. But I hear that he was an absolute charmer, an absolute sweetie, and a real creative kind of energy on almost any film set. And tragically, he died, apparently, uh, in his sleep on location while shooting a film called Dangerous Waters in the Dominican Republic. There is a film that's been shot that hasn't been released yet called Cocaine Bear. We posted about this, I think, way back in lockdown. This is the story of an enormous consignment of cocaine that I think accidentally falls out of the hangar of a plane or something, and a grizzly bear consumes it. And then I think, I think I'm right in thinking that the drug smugglers try to find the bear, because of course it's worth so much, this kind of cocaine stash, but they've got this completely psychotic, high, rampant grizzly bear who's off its head on, uh, on cocaine. And that's still to come out, cocaine bear, uh, which I think is due out next year. Uh, in other news, this is just a picture story, but I thought it's a nice opportunity just to get excited about the new Indiana Jones film. Here's a still. Look at the colour. The colour is the same colour as the gold, um, well, the, the, the gold trophy or kind of statue or bust that he, that he replaces. Do you remember he has the bag of sand, drops a bit of sand, moves it and puts the sand in place with it. Similar sort of gold, similar sense of archaeological dig, similar sense of desert and all that kind of stuff. I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I'm getting the smell, I'm getting the sounds, I can hear the bullwhip, I can hear his sarcasm, I can hear the kind of creak of his leather cap or his, and his leather belt. I'm so excited. Are you excited? It hasn't been given a subtitle yet, it's just Indiana Jones 5. James Mangold is the director, starring alongside Harrison Ford as Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Mads Mikkelsen, Antonio Banderas and Boyd Holbrook. Um, it's, I'm, and Toby Jones is in there too. I'm really excited and this is due out I think on the 30th of June next year. And so Cam is coming to a sort of roundup. I think the Palm Door is to be announced tonight or when this goes up last night, this weekend at some point anyway. Some of the sort of movie highlights, some of the things to kind of keep your ear to the ground on and think, oh, when that, when's that coming? When's that going to be released in the future? Obviously Elvis had its premiere. Everyone is extraordinarily excited. Austin Butler was there. Some people su suggesting that perhaps Baz Luhrmann just kind of only delivers a Baz Luhrmann film and so doesn't really take care of his subject matter. It's perhaps a Baz Luhrmann show more than it is ever about the person or the thing that it's about. I don't entirely know if I agree with that. I mean, he's a visionary, isn't he? He really is Baz Luhrmann. Uh, Park Chan-wook's new film, Decision to Leave, has been described as sensual, swooning, and a Hitchcockian mystery. Uh, Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future got a huge standing ovation. This is the film with Viggo Mortensen and uh, Leah Sido, in which it's about synthetic bio bi biology, synthesized biology, how we can, you know, this synthesized world, this future world of tech, and body performance art you've probably seen the trailer Ear, ears tied uh, sewn onto foreheads all that kind of stuff body horror body horror body horror someone some smart ass said you know who's ever going to boo david cronenberg at the Cannes film festival he's an absolute sort of darling there the darden brothers uh, they brought a film called tori and lakita uh, which looks at uh, the story of some immigrant children down on their luck uh, poverty stricken um, trying to make ends meet and then there's holy spider ali abbasi's uh, iranian movie uh, about a killer who preys on sex workers um, um, so Iranian cinema, so, yeah, Iranian cinema is quite something. I forget the name of that. There was that film in recent years, wasn't there? What was it, what was it called? It was about a sort of, I think it was about a vampire. She was a vampire. She'd walk around in, in, in sort of hijab, I think, and yet she was actually secretly a, a vampire. Ruben Ostlund's film, uh, The Triangle of Sadness, or Triangle of Sadness, has kind of got most people excited, and I think it might end up being the film that wins the Palm d'Or. This is by the guy who gave us Force Majeure, which if you haven't seen, please check it out. It's an astonishing film about the moment an avalanche sort of crashes through a ski a ski resort. But, and it's less about the damage it does, though it is about the damage it does, but it's about the damage done to a family because the father doesn't actually rescue or, or, or jump to the safe to try and save his family. He saves himself, and then it's about the erosion of what that signifies to, to within the family structure. Very clever, very clever, very funny film. Uh, funny, dark funny. Uh, trying, he did another film called, I think, was it The Square, which was a kind of about the art world, and it was pretty hideous. Uh, this film is called Triangle of Sadness, and this takes place on a luxury yacht in which Woody Harrelson is the skipper. This, to me, sounds a little bit like Below Deck, 
given a movie treatment. Uh, apparently Woody Harrelson as the self-loathing drunk captain. Woody Harrelson himself is in recovery, so that'll be a fascinating performance by him. Uh, and it's about how billionaires just vomit everywhere and, 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 and just fall all over the place. And I think, I think something like a storm hits and we just watch in real time the horror and disgust of people shitting themselves and vomiting everywhere. Triangle of Sadness. Belgian director Lucas Dantz Close has got a lot of people talking. It's in competition. Uh, it's described as a devastating tale of boyhood friendship uh, and its eventual ruin. It's been compared to another Belgian film that I was talking about recently called Playground. Some Apparently this film also features some remarkable performances by some, some young actors. Um, Kelly Reichardt, who gave us First Cow, a film that uh, we've reviewed elsewhere on the channel. Please check it out. She makes really meditative, really thoughtful, really unsensationalist films, but she's made a film called Showing Up, which is which stars Misha Williams, who I'm, I'm a huge fan of, and she's a struggling sculptor, and the blurb says that she's a struggling sculptor on Oregon's arts and crafts fringes, probably in Portland, Oregon. Um, and, and, you know, there's not a huge drama here, and it's just a profile of a woman preparing for, a, for a, an exhibition, so it'll be a meditation on art, but apparently Misha Williams is absolutely fantastic at the centre of it. Other films that have been touted around in the marketplace is a film called The Silent Twins, starring and executive produced by Letitia Wright, she of Black Panther. This is the story of two sisters, June and Jennifer Gibbons, who were entirely silent, communicating with each other only through private language. Apparently they became obsessed with writing fiction, um, dating boys, but committing crime as well in their teens, and things become ever more dangerous in their relationship. And of course, there have been other dramas at the Cannes Film Festival. Smoke grenades were set off, um, draw drawing attention to the 129 femicides committed in France in the past year. And as I say elsewhere, the three thousand years of longing the George Miller movie was uh, was disrupted by a topless gate crasher protesting about rape crimes in Ukraine so as ever a colorful Cannes Film Festival where many of the films that we're going to end up watching and talking about and getting excited about in, in future months have already landed casting story Macaulay Culkin do you remember him Macaulay Culkin from Home Alone he signed up for a movie which we've discussed before uh, uh, called Rich Flu um, this is also being uh, touted around at Cannes it also stars Rosamund Pike um, they've also signed up, signed up Daniel Brühl um, and the director is Galda Gastello Urutia I'll try saying that quickly uh, he directed the uh, lot down hit Netflix hit the platform in which the hierarchies of societies a society the haves and the have nots are sort of placed in a prison on different floors food go is passed down and the further down it goes the less food there is and people have to scramble for survival well this takes a kind of similar approach except it looks at the whole concept of wealth the mega wealthy and rich flu uh, sort of focuses on a strange disease that springs up which affects the mega wealthy you know Elon Musk style wealthy and gradually works its way down the wealth ladder and the only way people can try and kind of avoid this disease or avoid this flu if you like this rich flu is by redistributing their wealth and sharing it or getting rid of it and all that kind of stuff so there's a mad scramble a sort of economic chaos is, is created within this curious curious concept so it's called rich flu by the director of the platform now starring macaulay culkin too over to streaming jodie foster in, what, what, what do you make of jodie foster um if i'm really honest i've always found her kind of not, she never punches it to the back of the net for me even in things like The Accused or Silence of the Lambs. And just, there's always something holding me back from really going with her. I mean, I know she's good, she's won Oscar, she's done, you know, I mean, she's obviously, I don't know, she never quite does it for me. Anyway, Jodie Foster is going to be starring in and producing season four of True Detective. True Detective, which is that series that the first series starred Woody Harrelson and uh, Matthew McConaughey. Uh, other series have starred Vince Vaughn, Mahashala Ali, Colin Farrell, Rachel McAdams. Uh, but this is the fourth, fourth series is coming and it's set in Alaska and it's called True Detective The Night Country, which I I love anything set in Alaska or the, the outer reaches, the northern regions of Canada and stuff like that. Uh, and this is the blurb. It follows two detectives, Liz Danvers, uh, Foster, uh, and Evangeline Navarro, who are looking to solve the case of six men that operate the Tassal Arctic Research Station who vanish without trace when the long winter night falls in Ennis, Alaska. The pair will have to confront the darkness they carry in themselves and dig into the haunted truths that lie buried under the eternal ice. Believe me, when you've travelled and, and camped and worked and walked and tried to survive on ice, there's a real dark sense of what's underneath, what is under there, what is under there. 
Last week we were talking about a new potential um, Disney Plus Star Wars series, uh, which was going to focus on youngsters, a little bit like the Goonies, perhaps jumping into, uh, you know, X-Wing fighters and, and, and all that kind of stuff, and joyriding and all that kind of stuff. Well, at Star Wars Celebration this week, they confirmed it's called Ske Star Wars The Skeleton Crew, and uh, it's directed by John Watts, who's done all the recent uh, Spider-Man films. It is going to start, uh, as rumours were swirling already about this, it is going to star Jude Law, and it is going to focus on, quote, a group of kids who are about 10 years old who get lost in the Star Wars universe. Uh, but they're keen to stress, do you remember what I was saying last week, this will be good as long as they don't over sort of patronise the audience and make it for six year olds. But they say it stars for kids, but it's not a show for kids. And I think that's really good. I'm thinking we're going to get a bit of the Goonies. I'm thinking we're going to get that sort of, you know, that kind of 80s kind of vibe. He's super 8, almost like Super 8. Top Gun obviously is out this week. We're going to be reviewing that on the channel over the next couple of days. Uh, and Val Kilmer makes a very emotional actual uh, appearance in the film. It's a, quite an emotional moment. Obviously, he's struggling. He's in remission from throat cancer. But uh, obviously, another another trailer that landed this week was Willow, also at the Star Wars celebration because it comes from Lucas Films. Um, so the trailer for Willow the series, the follow-up to the uh, 1988 movie of the same name, starring Warwick Davis, Joanne Wally, and obviously Val Kilmer, uh, a sort of classic sort of wishy-washy, beautiful, wonderful kind of fantasy uh, sword and sorcery adventure type thing. It wasn't a massive hit, but it's kind of developed a cult following over the years. Um, Val Kilmer was in, was in the original, um, and the trailer landed for it this week. I'm very excited about it. Go and check it out. You can have a, have a look at it with me. Uh, but apparently uh, Val Kilmer is going to be, and has, although he's not featured in the trailer, is going to be part of the new series. Um, due to uh, his illness, his throat cancer, and due to the fact that most of it was shot during uh, COVID lockdowns, uh, he couldn't fly over. How he's going to be involved is anyone's guess, but his character, which they just described as the Han Solo-ish rogue Mad Martigan uh, will be will be in here. Um the producer, Jonathan Kasdan, who was also the, the guy behind or the writer of Han Solo, the Star Wars story, Solo, he says, Val's a huge part of this, and the first conversation I had when Warwick and I got the green light to do this was with Val. Warwick Davis said, likewise, we're great friends, and the fact that he's joining us again, uh, his, his original spirit and energy kept me going when I was just 17 on the original film. Warwick Davis was just 17 when he made the original film, and so hopefully they're bringing the team back together. Which brings us to Films of the Week, and I have to confess, I think there's pretty much only one film of the week of any real note this week, and that is Top Gun Maverick. Starring, of course, Tom Cruise, who seems to be getting younger and sort of more childlike and, and roguish and, and raffish. He just smiles, he laughs, he laughs. He's having a great time, Tom, and he looks great for 60. I think he's 60. I think he's 60. Um, this is a what they call a legacy sequel, and it's a big deal, this, because this kind of legacy sequel, if this does well at the box office, rest assured you're going to get legacy sequels of other things, you know, what that means, like Beverly Hills Cop, stuff like that, stuff from the 80s that could possibly be rejuvenated and repackaged. And this is a revisit. He plays the same character. He kind of, he's brought in to kind of mobilize a, a, a team, a crack squad of pilots, because they need to take out a major uh, structure or, or in installation, I think in Iran. Um, and it's about him training them all up. There's a bit of beef between him and one of the other kind of uh, students or, or cadets, because of course there's, there's beef, there's history. Um, it stars Jennifer Connelly as well. And you know, I think good old American fast planes, lots of flags, lots of slow-mo, lots of sun setting on tarmacs with the kind of, you know, the cockpits of the airplanes all there and lots of, you know, aircraft carriers. As I say, we're going to review it. So if you fancy a nice bit of, I don't know, a bit of 80s nostalgia and a bit of sort of mindless escapism and buddy movie type stuff with an incredibly emotional cameo from Val Kilmer, that could be your film of the week. And there you have a rushed rush through the weekly rushes, uh, all your streaming and movie news in one place. Tell us what you think about the stories, share your thoughts and have a fabulous film watching weekend. For more film and family fun, don't forget to click the subscribe button and make sure to click the bell to never miss an update.